Hello, and welcome to Air Cleaners for Nanoparticles. My name is Pete Rayner. I'm a faculty member at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health. The learning objectives for this lesson are that, by the end of the module, learners should be able to list the main technologies used to remove particles from moving air, identify air cleaning technologies that are effective for nanoparticles, describe the mechanisms by which fibrous air filters capture particles, and explain why fibrous air filters can capture nanoparticles with high efficiency. There are a variety of factors that influence air cleaner selection. They can be categorized into characteristics of the moving air from which a pollutant must be removed, characteristics of the pollutant, and the required outlet conditions for the air leaving the air cleaner. The airflow characteristics include the flow rate of the air, temperature, humidity, and the pressure, especially if the air in the system is either at a vacuum or overpressured relative to the air outside the system. The pollutant characteristics include the form of the pollutant, particles, gases, or vapors, as well as the concentration of the pollutant. If particles are the pollutant of concern, what is the size distribution of the particles in the air? Are the particles solid or liquid? Are they sticky? Are they viscous? Are they abrasive? Also, is the pollutant corrosive? Required outlet conditions might be set by standards, regulations, or permits, and might include the concentrations of the pollutants, the size distribution in case there are different requirements for different sizes of particles, and requirements that might be more stringent if the air will be recirculated back into a workplace. Important parameters to consider when evaluating different air cleaners include, first and foremost, the efficiency of the air cleaner. All else being equal, we want efficiency to be as high as practicable. The flip side of efficiency is penetration. While efficiency is how much of a material coming into an air cleaner is removed, penetration is how much gets through, which could be more important from the standpoint of exposure. Another important parameter is pressure drop. The pressure drop across a collector is related to how much energy is required to move air through the collector, which, in turn, is related to the cost of operating the collector. A higher pressure drop is more costly. Other parameters include the reliability of the collector. Is it going to work each and every time? The maintenance requirements. Are there significant costs associated with having to change out collection media like filters? Or do elements of the collector break down frequently? The size of the collector, can the collector fit into a suitable space inside or outside of the workspace? And capital expense, how much will it cost to install the collector? Particle collectors that use a variety of operating principles are available. They include settling chambers, inertial collectors, cyclones, particle scrubbers, electrostatic precipitators, fabric filters, and fibrous filters. While we will talk at least briefly about all of these approaches, we will focus most on fibrous filters. In a settling chamber, a particle-laden airstream enters a larger plenum and slows down because the cross-sectional area is so large. Velocity is equal to the airflow rate divided by the cross-sectional area. So, if the area increases, the velocity must slow down. As the velocity slows, particles have a better opportunity to fall out of the air due to gravity. In a settling chamber, as the image on the right shows, particles fall due to gravity into a hopper and are collected there. They have low pressure drop and can be used with high temperature airstreams. However, settling chambers are generally useful only for particles with diameters larger than about 50 micrometers. Additional collectors using different operating principles are required for smaller particles. Therefore, this is not a technology that is effective for nanoparticles. Inertial collectors capture particles as they deviate from air streamlines that follow a tortuous route through the collector. These tortuous routes require the air and the particles to make several sharp turns. Larger particles are unable to follow the air streamlines due to their inertia, and they may be collected on surfaces within the collector. A couple of examples are shown in the illustrations on the right. At the top is a curtain collector in which the air encounters a series of elements and must make a greater than 90 degree turn in order to get through each element. 
Collected particles build up on the inside of the elements, and they can be rinsed off later using a cleaning system. Another example is a louver collector, where the air comes in from the top and makes a turn greater than 90 degrees. Particles can potentially be collected on louvers and then later be rinsed off. Care must always be taken with inertia collectors to ensure that the particles do not build up too much and block the airflow. So a cleaning approach is required. For inertial collectors, the 50% cut point, the size at which 50% of the particles will be collected, varies by the design. But this technology is only effective for particles with diameters larger than about 5 micrometers. Pressure drops required to achieve a smaller 50% cut point would make these collectors completely impractical. Therefore, inertial collectors are not an approach that is suitable for nanomaterials. Cyclones collect particles by centrifugal force. The diagram on the right shows how dirty air containing particles comes in and swirls around the inside wall, kind of like a tornado. Large particles cannot follow the air streamlines due to their inertia, impact the inner wall, and fall toward the bottom of the cyclone where they can be collected. When the cleaned air reaches the bottom of the cyclone, it moves up through the middle of the cyclone and out of the collector. There are large industrial scale cyclones and ones that are smaller that can be used in a laboratory or a small manufacturing facility. Cyclones have many advantages, including that they are good for air flows at extreme temperatures and pressures, they can handle high flow rates of air, they are suitable for high particle mass concentrations, they are inexpensive and relatively easy to make, and they work well for mist droplets in addition to solid particles. Cyclones perform poorly with sticky or hygroscopic dust because the particles tend to cling to the inner wall rather than falling down into the bottom of the collector and into a hopper. The pressure drop across cyclones can vary widely depending on the specific design. This is a very effective technology for particles larger than about 5 micrometers in diameter. Unfortunately, they are not effective for smaller particles. So, much like settling chambers and inertial collectors, cyclones are not suitable for removing nanoparticles from airstreams. Particle scrubbers collect particles by impaction onto falling drops. There are a couple of different types. As shown in the image, a spray tower releases drops, much like rainfall, into an upward-flowing, dirty airstream. These collectors have low pressure drop, and they capture most particles larger than about 10 micrometers in diameter. However, they are not effective for nanoscale particles. As shown in the second image, a Venturi scrubber brings particles and drops together in a high-velocity jet. The airstream is compressed as it passes through a region where there is a frothy liquid. The particles impact onto that frothy liquid, and they leave this region encapsulated in drops. Venturi scrubbers are considerably more efficient than spray towers, with the ability to capture some, but certainly not all, submicrometer particles. The cost of this greater efficiency is a very high pressure drop. The large drops leaving a Venturi scrubber that contain the incoming particles can be removed from the airstream very effectively by a cyclone. Both types of particle scrubbers perform well with sticky particles. However, the liquid which contains the collected particles may need to be treated before being reused or released. The bottom line is that while particle scrubbers, especially Venturi scrubbers, can be more efficient than settling chambers, inertia collectors, and cyclones, they are not highly effective for nanoparticles. Electrostatic precipitators, or ESPs, operate by charging particles in an electric field and then collecting them on electrically grounded metal plates in an electric field. Particles can be charged either positively or negatively in ESPs. Wires at very high voltage, generally greater than 10,000 volts or 10 kilovolts, produce a corona that generates a flow of ions that attach to particles in a moving airstream. The voltage is limited on the upper end by the requirements that the corona must not lead to sparking which reduces the effectiveness of an electrostatic precipitator. Due to the high voltages and the risk of sparking, an ESP is a poor choice for flammable airstreams. Particles collected on the plates in an electrostatic precipitator are later either shaken off or washed off using a liquid in order to maintain effectiveness over long periods of time. Sticky particles are a concern for this cleaning. 
Therefore, ESPs may not be a suitable choice for sticky dusts. Electrostatic precipitators can be highly efficient for particles greater than several hundred nanometers. They can be up to 95% efficient for 100 nanometer particles and up to 90% efficient for 10 nanometer particles. While this efficiency is higher than for the other types of collectors we've discussed, even higher collection efficiency would be desirable. Because ESPs have low pressure drop, they are not expensive to operate. However, they are expensive to purchase and install. Electrostatic precipitators typically use one of two primary design approaches, single stage and two stage collectors. This slide shows diagrams of both types of ESP configurations. On the left, Single stage ESPs have two grounded plates that surround high voltage wires. The wires and plates are coming out of the screen perpendicular to the screen surface. The dirty air flows in from the left and clean air leaves from the right. The high voltage on the wires ionizes the air, here we're depicting the creation of positive ions, and the ions then move toward the grounded plates. Some of these ions will attach themselves to particles moving with the airflow causing the particles to become charged. The charged particles will then also move with the electrical field toward the grounded plates. It's a relatively simple but effective design. In a two-stage ESP, high voltage wires in the first stage charging section work very much like those in a single stage ESP, except that the charging section is much shorter. The second stage is a collection section in which a steady electrical field has been established between highly charged plates and grounded plates. These plates are much closer than those in single stage collectors leading to more intense electrical fields and higher collection efficiency. Fabric filters are cylindrical bags of woven or felted fabrics that collect particles mostly on the surface of the filter material. The filters are located in a housing in which the velocity of the air entering the housing slows down dramatically. The bags can be either inside or outside collectors, meaning that particles may be collected on either the inside or the outside of the cylindrical bags. Inside collectors are typically about 30 feet long, one foot in diameter, and have one to four cubic foot per minute per square foot air to cloth ratio, which is equivalent to a velocity of one to four feet per minute at the filter face. Outside collectors are shorter, typically about eight feet long, about four and a half inches in diameter and have an air to cloth ratio of five to 15 cubic feet per minute per square foot of cloth. The pressure drop across the fabric filter depends on the air to cloth ratio, the properties of the fabric, the amount of particles loaded onto the fabric, and particle properties including their size. The filters are cleaned cyclically. We might have tens or even hundreds of fabric filters in a single collector usually referred to as a bag house. One group of filters in a bag house can be taken offline briefly and cleaned while others continue to operate. Inside collectors are typically cleaned by mechanically shaking them or using a reverse gas flow. Outside collectors are cleaned by a pulse jet. Nozzles above the filter outlets release very short bursts of pressurized air that flex the fabric outward to knock off dust cakes that have built up on the outside of the filters. Fabric filters have relatively high efficiency. They capture particles larger than one micrometer in diameter with nearly 100% efficiency once a semi-permanent dust layer builds up on the fabric. Initially, the fabrics are less efficient. Because some time is required for the particle layer to build up naturally, particles are often released artificially into the airflow upstream of new filters to increase the efficiency faster. It is difficult to achieve greater than 95% efficiency for nanoscale particles because some of these particles will get around or through the dust layer. Fabric filters are compatible with high particle concentrations, but they perform poorly with sticky or hygroscopic particles because these particles are difficult to remove from the fabrics during cleaning cycles. These drawings show the air flows through an inside collector. In the diagram on the left, the dirty air enters near the bottom of the bag house and flows upward through the cylindrical fabric filters. The dirty air passes through the filters and is cleaned. The captured particles build up on the inside of the bags. As shown in the diagram on the right, the bags can be cleaned by a reverse gas flow that flexes the fabric filters inward and dislodges the captured particles in clumps that then fall into a hopper. 
An alternative to the reverse flow is to clean the bags by mechanically shaking them. In outside collectors, the dirty air enters the bag house, as shown in the diagram on the left, and flows through the bags from the outside, with particles collecting on the fabric surface. The cylindrical bags are supported by a cage or frame to keep them from collapsing inward. The clean air emerges on the inside of the bags and flows upward and out at the top. The diagram on the right shows what happens when these bags are cleaned by pulse jets. Pressurized air flows through a blowpipe to venturi nozzles that, when opened for fractions of a second, create a very strong pulse of air that flexes the bags rapidly outward, knocking collected particles off in clumps that fall into a hopper. The last air cleaning technology that we'll discuss is fibrous filtration, the technology that can be most efficient for nanoparticles and the one used most commonly to remove nanoparticles from airflows. Fibrous filters are beds of non-woven fibers that collect particles by both surface and depth filtration. This means that while particles can collect on the surface of fibrous filters, many more particles are captured within the depth of the filters. Due to this depth filtration, fibrous filters cannot be cleaned in most cases. Therefore, once they build up too much resistance to the air flowing into the filter, they must be discarded. Because they are not able to be cleaned, fibrous filters are not intended for high particle concentrations. So, for mixtures of nanoparticles and larger particles, many air cleaning systems use a combination of technologies, such as a cyclone or an electrostatic precipitator, that capture the larger particles, followed by fibrous filters to collect the remaining nanoparticles. This combination approach extends the useful life of the fibrous filters. There are a wide range of options for fibrous filters. They are available in many, many different configurations with any efficiency level that is needed. Fibrous filters can be highly, highly efficient, even for nanoparticles, and they can be more efficient than any other type of particle collector, especially for nanoparticles. For example, one class of filters is called High Efficiency Particulate Air, or HEPA, filters. These filters are defined as having greater than 99.97% efficiency for 300 nanometer diameter droplets using a standard test protocol. The pressure drop across a fibrous filter depends on the velocity of the airflow, the diameters of the fibers used in the filter, the solidity or packing density of the filter, the fraction of the volume occupied by the filter that is solid material, and the filter thickness in the direction of air movement. The surface area of the face of the filters can be increased with pleats or pockets, which can improve the collection of nanoparticles by slowing down the velocity of the air passing through the filter medium. The seating of a fibrous filter within a filter housing, or similarly the fit of a particle respirator to a wearer's face, must be proper for that high efficiency to be effective. If the particles can flow around a filter, then there is no point in having a filter that is highly efficient. This is a scanning electron micrograph of a fiberglass filter. We get a sense for the depth of the filter. We also see that the fibers are non-woven. They are random in their orientation in at least two dimensions. The fibers have a range of diameters. Manufacturers of certain types of filters will include fibers of many diameters to provide optimal collection of different size particles. How do fibrous filters capture particles? Let's talk first about three mechanical filtration mechanisms. The first is interception. Interception is the capture of particles that follow air streamlines. The central circle in this diagram represents a fiber with a circular cross section coming out of the screen. A spherical particle represented by a blue circle follows the air streamline moving around the fiber from left to right. The blue circles show the path of the particle along the streamline. If the particle is large enough, it will touch the fiber and be collected by interception. This is a physical process. Particles bigger than a certain size cannot pass by a fiber because they come in contact with it, even if they are following the air streamlines. The second mechanism, impaction, relies on the inertia of particles. Particles that are relatively large and or heavy will deviate from air streamlines, especially if the velocity through the filter is high. In the second diagram, the movement of a particle with a lot of inertia from left to right is illustrated by the red circles. The particle deviates from the air streamline and impacts on the forward surface of the fiber. This mechanism is sometimes referred to as inertial impaction. 
The third mechanical filtration mechanism is diffusion. In this case, a small particle will have difficulty following an airstream line because it wanders away from the airstream line due to Brownian motion. If the particle moves far enough in the right direction, it may impact the fiber surface and be captured. In the third diagram, this diffusion capture mechanism is illustrated by the motion of a particle represented by the green circles. Interception, impaction, and diffusion are the three most important mechanical filtration mechanisms. Equations have been developed to predict the efficiency of particle capture by single fibers for these three mechanisms. Interception efficiency, the Greek letter eta sub r, can be predicted by the equation 1 plus r divided by 2 times something called the Kuhr-Bara number times the long complicated expression in brackets. This expression contains three variables. R is the interception parameter, which is the ratio of the particle diameter to the fiber diameter. KU is called the Kuhr-Bara number, which is a property of the flow field that is predicted for the air flowing around the fiber. The Kuhr-Bara number is a function of alpha, which is the solidity or packing density of the filter, the fraction of the filter volume that is occupied by fibers as opposed to air. The solidity also appears in the efficiency equation. So interception efficiency can be predicted from the interception parameter, the Kuhr-Bara number, and the filter solidity. The predictive equation for impaction efficiency, eta sub i, includes three factors. The parameter j, a non-dimensional parameter called the Stokes number, STK, and the Kuhr-Bara number. The Stokes number, related to the particle size, the air velocity, and other parameters, increases as particle inertia increases. It is equal to 1 over 18 times the particle density times the particle diameter squared times the velocity of the air flowing across the face of the filter times the Cunningham slip correction factor divided by the air viscosity and the fiber diameter. The Cunningham slip correction factor accounts for the fact that particles smaller than about 1 micrometer are affected by individual air molecules rather than being affected by air as though it is a continuous fluid. The equation for J was developed empirically. It is a function of the filter solidity and the interception parameter. Diffusion efficiency, eta sub d, can be predicted from two factors, the Kuhr-Bara number and a non-dimensional parameter called the Peclet number, PE. The Peclet number relates particle diffusion due to Brownian motion to particle advection due to airflow. The Peclet number is equal to the air velocity times the fiber diameter divided by the diffusion coefficient of the particle, capital D. The diffusion coefficient is equal to the Boltzmann constant times the absolute temperature times the slip correction factor divided by 3 times pi, the air viscosity, and the particle diameter. How do we use these three single fiber efficiency equations for individual mechanisms to predict an overall single fiber efficiency and total filter efficiency? We add the single fiber efficiencies for the three mechanisms together to estimate the overall single fiber efficiency. So the single fiber efficiency is equal to the interception efficiency plus the impaction efficiency plus the diffusion efficiency. Using assumptions about the distribution of fibers within a filter, we calculate total filter efficiency from the single fiber efficiency as being equal to 1 minus the mathematical constant E to the power minus 4 times the filter solidity times the thickness of the filter, L, times the single fiber efficiency divided by pi and the fiber diameter. We also have a formula for predicting the pressure drop across a fibrous filter. This is an empirical formula based on measurements of many different fibrous filters. The pressure drop is set equal to the velocity of air entering the filter times the air viscosity times the thickness of the filter divided by fiber diameter squared times the function of the solidity of the filter. When we use the equations to predict single fiber efficiency, we can look at how efficiency changes as a function of particle diameter for each mechanism and for a single fiber overall. For a filter made from fibers that are 5 micrometers in diameter with a solidity or packing density of 0.05 or 
a face velocity of 10 centimeters per second, and assuming that particles have a density of one gram per cubic centimeter, we get the curves shown in this figure. For the interception and impaction mechanisms, single fiber efficiency increases as particle diameter increases. On the other hand, for the diffusion mechanism, efficiency increases as the particle diameter decreases because smaller particles move more by Brownian motion than larger particles. When we add these three curves together, we have the overall single fiber efficiency represented by the solid dark curve. The overall single fiber efficiency curve has a minimum between about 0.2 to 0.3 micrometer or 200 to 300 nanometers. Particles larger than this minimum are collected more effectively by interception and impaction, whereas particles smaller than the minimum are captured more effectively by diffusion. This minimum efficiency at 200 to 300 nanometers is why HEPA filters are tested for efficiency using 300 nanometer diameter droplets. These curves are typical for filters that collect particles by mechanical filtration mechanisms. The predictions have clear implications for the fibrous filtration of nanoparticles because they tell us that, due to diffusion, fibrous filters can be highly efficient at removing nanoparticles from air streams. When we use the single fiber efficiency to predict total filter efficiency using the same parameters as on the previous slide, with a filter thickness of 2 millimeters, we end up with this curve for efficiency as a function of particle diameter. The efficiency is high for large particles and very small particles with a minimum efficiency at a diameter between 0.2 and 0.3 micrometer or 200 and 300 nanometers. An important filtration mechanism that we have not talked about yet is electrostatic attraction. Electrostatic charges can be built into fibrous filters to enhance their efficiency. Four different scenarios can be considered related to fiber and particle charge conditions. So far, we've been considering scenarios in which neither fibers nor particles carry charge. However, we can have scenarios in which just the fibers are charged, but not the particles, in which the particles are charged, but not the fibers, and in which both the fibers and the particles carry charge. When considering filtration by electrostatic attraction, we are generally interested in filters made from fibers that carry charges and particles from workplace or outdoor environments. Usually there is a distribution of charges on these particles, so some will carry positive or negative charges and some will be uncharged. Thus we will focus most on scenarios B and D from this table. Let's look at electrostatic filtration mechanisms a little more closely. A charge on a fiber can attract oppositely charged particles by columbic forces. As illustrated in this diagram, a negative charge on a fiber will enhance collection of a particle carrying a positive charge. The same will be true for positive charges on fibers and particles carrying negative charges. Because most electrostatically charged filters carry both negative and positive charges on their fibers, the capture of both positively and negatively charged particles is enhanced. If a fiber carries a negative charge but a particle is neutral so that it does not carry a net charge, the charge on the fiber can induce a dipole, a polarization of charge, within the particle that causes the neutral particle to be drawn toward the fiber. If a fiber does not carry a charge but a particle does, the particle, if it gets close enough to the fiber, will induce an image force on the fiber that enhances the fiber's ability to attract the particle. In essence, the particle helps itself be collected. Fibrous filters that carry electrostatic charges are often referred to as electret filters. Electret filters have been around since about 1930. Different processes are used to create these filter materials. When fibers made from two different materials are placed together and rub against each other, negative charges can build up on one material while positive charges build up on the other. This process, referred to as triboelectric charging, can create a filter with stable charges made from two different types of fibers. The earliest electret filters, called Hansen filters or resin wool filters, were made using triboelectric charging. Today, triboelectrically charged filter materials are produced by layering one type of fiber on top of another and then carting them together using needles to mix the fibers together and cause them to rub against each other, creating the stable charge. Corona-charged electret filter materials are created using an ionization source 
that causes one side of a fiber to be charged positively and the other side to be charged negatively. These can include split fiber materials where a polymer sheet is charged in this manner and then the sheet is sliced into thin fibers and melt blown materials that are charged after being formed into filters. Induction charging, which occurs during the electrostatic spraying of polymers, applies electrostatic charges to polymer fibers as they are created. This is a particularly good way to create electron filters because fibers with very small diameters are created, even ones with diameters smaller than one micrometer, that can be very effective at capturing particles. As mentioned previously, both positive and negative charges are generally present on electron filters. Why should we consider using electron filters? The electrostatic attraction mechanisms allows for better filter performance. Electret filters can achieve lower pressure drop through the filter with the same efficiency as purely mechanical filters or higher efficiency for the same pressure drop. Applications include large building heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, or HVAC filtration, home air filters, respirator filters, most of which are electret filters, and some air pollution control filters. Equations are shown here for predicting single fiber efficiency by the electrostatic attraction mechanism when both the fibers and particles carry charge, and when the fibers carry charge but the particles are neutral. For the charged fiber and particles, the single fiber efficiency is equal to the Cunningham slip correction factor times the fiber charge per unit length times the charge on a particle divided by the product of 3 times pi times the permittivity of free space a measure of how easy it is to form an electric field in a vacuum, times the air viscosity, times the particle diameter, times the fiber diameter, times the velocity of the air flowing through the filter. For the collection of neutral particles by charged fibers, the expression is more complicated. It uses many of the same terms, but also includes the dielectric constant of the particle material, which indicates whether a particle is electrically conductive or insulating. What is the influence of electrostatic attraction on the penetration of particles through filters? This figure from Romay and co-authors shows the penetration of particles through a filter on a logarithmic scale as a function of particle diameter for the four different combinations of fiber and particle charging. If we compare curve two to curve four, we can see the effect of charging a filter on the collection of uncharged or neutral particles. The efficiency is enhanced, the penetration is reduced, more effectively for particles larger than 10 to the minus 1 micrometer or 100 nanometers than for nanoscale particles. Larger particles are affected more than smaller ones because the strength of the induced dipole is proportional to the volume of the particle. If we next compare curve 1 to curve 3, we are considering the effects of filter charging on particles that each carry a single charge regardless of their diameter. In this comparison, we see broad decreases in penetration, or increases in efficiency, across all particle sizes when we use a charged filter versus an uncharged filter. One thing to keep in mind, however, is that many particles larger than about 80 nanometers are likely to carry multiple charges, allowing them to be captured more effectively. In addition, particles can carry considerably higher levels of charge as size increases, making electrostatic attraction much more effective than if the particles carry only a single charge. The effects of electrostatic enhancement on filter efficiency can be substantial when we consider particles with an equilibrium charge distribution. These graphs from a paper by Rangasamy and co-authors show penetration through respirator filters as a function of particle size. The authors measured penetration for a variety of respirator filters that carry electrostatic charge. Then they rinsed the filters with isopropyl alcohol, which removes the charges from the filters. In each of the four figures, the two higher curves are for filters that have been discharged and no longer carry electrostatic charges. The lower curves are for the charged filters. The filters that carry electrostatic charge have much lower penetration or much higher efficiency than the ones that have been discharged. While the effects of electrostatic charging are more pronounced for particles larger than 100 nanometers than for particles smaller than 100 nanometers, because large particles can carry many more charges, 
The improved capture due to electrostatic effects is still very significant for many nanoparticles. The American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning Engineers, or ASHRAE, publishes standard test protocols to measure filter performance. Over the years, there have been three different tests. One is called arrestance, which was included in ASHRAE standard 52.1-1992, a standard that has since been withdrawn, but is an addendum to the current standard 52.2-2007. The arrestance test measures the percentage of a standard test dust captured by a filter on a mass basis. This is a single measure of efficiency integrated across all sizes of particles in the test dust. Another test, once very common but no longer used, was the dust spot efficiency test. This test was a little odd. It measures the percentage of staining atmospheric dust collected. It involved optical measurement of atmospheric dust collected on target papers upstream and downstream from the filter being evaluated. Because the results depended on the properties of the dust in the atmosphere at a test facility, it was not a very consistent or reliable test, and it did not provide efficiency data for different particle sizes. In ASHRAE standards 52.2-1999 and 2007, the minimum efficiency reporting value, or MERV rating, was introduced. This test measures filter efficiency on a count basis in three particle size ranges using salt particles generated by standard methods. The three size ranges are 0.3 to 1 micrometer, 1 to 3 micrometers, and 3 to 10 micrometers. Notably, none of the size ranges in the test protocol include nanoparticles. The protocol includes a conditioning test to measure how efficiency may change as particles are collected on a filter. MERV ratings are assigned based on the results of the efficiency tests. As shown in this table, MERV ratings of 1 to 4 only consider the results of the arrestance tests. Therefore, filters in these categories are only effective for very large particles. As we move down the table to ratings of 5 to 8, we start to see higher efficiency for particles in the range of 3 to 10 micrometers in diameter. For MERV ratings of 9 to 12, the efficiency for particles in the range of 1 to 3 micrometers starts to increase. Finally, for ratings of 13 to 16, we start to see high efficiencies for particles in the 0.3 to 1 micrometer range. None of these standard tests consider the effectiveness of filters against nanoparticles. While this may not be much of a problem for purely mechanical filters that have a minimum efficiency at around 0.3 micrometer or 300 nanometers, it is a considerable limitation for electret filters that are likely to have a minimum efficiency at a diameter smaller than 100 nanometers. Filters do not capture air molecules because individual molecules move so quickly that they bounce right off of a fiber if they come in contact with one. This is referred to as thermal rebound. At some small diameter, nanoparticles may do the same thing. In 1991, Wang and Casper used a theoretical approach to predict that thermal rebound would occur in filters for particles smaller than about 10 nanometers. As shown in the figure, they predicted that penetration would reach a minimum at about 10 nanometers and then increase for smaller particles, rather than showing a continuous decrease as predicted by diffusion theory. This would present an obvious concern for the effectiveness of fibrous filters at capturing the smallest nanoparticles. In 2005, Belazian co-authors presented some measurements at the European Aerosol Conference that seemed to suggest that thermal rebound occurred for particles that were smaller than about 20 nanometers. Their graphs, which show efficiency rather than penetration as a function of particle diameter, indicated that efficiency decreased dramatically as particle size decreased for particles smaller than 20 nanometers in diameter for two different filters. Another group of researchers, however, was able to show that there were methodological errors related to the efficiency measurements in the Belazi et al. study. Subsequently, three research groups tried to verify the Belazi et al. findings, but they could not. Let's take a look at their results. Hyman co-authors published a study that measured filtration efficiency as a function of particle diameter, and they did not observe any decrease in efficiency as a sign of thermal rebound for particles down to about 2.5 nanometers. Their measurements largely followed filtration theory. 
Kim and co-authors published a paper with this figure showing penetration as a function of particle diameter that indicated that efficiency increased as particle diameter decreased for particles at least down to 2 nanometers in diameter. A group from the University of Minnesota with a different lead author with the last name of Kim showed that penetration decreased, in other words efficiency increased, down to particles of about 3 nanometers in diameter. So all three studies showed that thermal rebound will not occur in fibrous filters for particles larger than 2 to 3 nanometers. The Kim et al. study from 2006 did show an increase in penetration for particles smaller than about 2 nanometers, suggesting that thermal rebound may occur for these very smallest particles. This may not be much of an issue, however, in a practical sense because we do not expect many 1 to 2 nanometer particles to remain as individual particles for very long. According to coagulation theory, we expect such small nanoparticles to rapidly form agglomerates that function effectively as larger particles that are likely to be collected by fibrous filters very effectively. The bottom line is that fibrous filters are capable of collecting nanoparticles with very high efficiency if the filters are designed appropriately. One caution we need to keep in mind, however, is that we do not know very much about changes in filter performance with time as the filters collect and load with engineered nanoparticles. The evidence that we have with other kinds of particles gives us reason for concern about changes in fibrous filter performance with use. For instance, we visited 140 hospitals in the state of Minnesota and tested filter efficiency with a P-Track ultrafine particle counter, a condensation particle counter, to answer the question, do filters work as well as they are rated? In each hospital, we entered an air handling unit upstream and downstream from its filter bank to measure particle number concentrations or we inserted a probe through holes drilled upstream and downstream of the filter bank through which we made the measurements. We compared the efficiency that we calculated from the measurements to the dust spot efficiency indicated on the filter itself. This plot of measured efficiency on the vertical axis versus rated filter efficiency on the horizontal axis indicated that, in almost all cases, the measured efficiency was either lower or much lower than the efficiency that we thought we would see. There could be a couple of reasons for these discrepancies. One is that the filters might not have been installed properly so that they were not seated well against the filter mount. And proper filter seating can allow leaks around the filters. However, it is unlikely that almost all of the filters would be improperly seated. Another possibility is that electric filters used for HVAC filtration did not perform as well as they were rated once they have been used for a while. Regardless of the reason, it does not appear that the filters performed as well as they were rated. We decided to investigate the performance of electrostatically charged filters with use more deeply. Some laboratory tests have shown that efficiency declines as electric filters load with dust, while other tests in labs show that efficiency stays the same or increases. Therefore, our objectives in this study, which ended up being published in 2004, were to measure the efficiency and pressure drop for electrostatically charged filters for several months in working HVAC systems. We installed filters in a building and then measured the efficiency over time. In addition, we did the same for filters that did not carry electrostatic charge in a parallel HVAC system. This image shows our test filters. On the left is a filter made from uncharged glass fibers. Its face was two feet tall by two feet wide, and the filter had 15 pleats. The pleats go back and forth through the depth of the frame to provide more filter area. These filters were 90 to 95% efficient according to the ASHRAE dust spot efficiency test, which was the standard test at the time of the study. The filter on the right was made from synthetic polymer fibers that carried electrostatic charge. Like the other filters, these electric filters measured 2 feet by 2 feet across the face, had 15 pleats, and were 90 to 95 percent efficient according to the dust spot test. The test location was Hasselmoe Hall, a laboratory building on the University of Minnesota campus. The two air handling units that were used were nearly identical. They had adjacent air intakes that used 100 percent outdoor air. The units had the same layout and equipment. Each was capable of moving as much as 60,000 cubic feet per minute, or CFM, of air. 
The flows through the two systems were similar, but varied depending on the demands of the spaces within the building. Each system included pre-filters that prevented most particles larger than about 3 micrometers in diameter from reaching the test filters. The humidification systems were turned off throughout the test period so that water droplets would never interfere with the measurements. The test filters included 30 fiberglass filters in air handling unit number one in five rows by six columns, and 30 synthetic polyolefin fiber filters in air handling unit number three in the same configuration. Air was sampled through long probes that were inserted either upstream or downstream of the filter banks and could be moved to four different locations, each denoted by a red X on the drawing, at which we measured size differentiated concentrations. We measured efficiency on many dates over about four and a half months. We measured efficiency more frequently toward the beginning of the test than near the end to document the rapid initial changes in filter performance. Nevertheless, we made regular measurements throughout the test period of late June to early November. For each test, we measured 32 size distributions. These included measurements in the two air handling units, at four locations per air handling unit, at upstream and downstream points for each location, and with two instruments at each point. We measured the size distribution for particles between 0.5 and 3 micrometers using an aerodynamic particle sizer, or APS. The APS measures particle sizes using the time of flight for particles in an accelerated airstream. We measured particles between 0.15 and 0.5 micrometer, or 150 to 500 nanometers, with a differential mobility particle sizer, or DMPS, an instrument that separates particles by size according to their electrical mobility, and then counts the particles in each size interval using a condensation particle counter. For pressure drop, we referred to data measured and stored hourly by the computer that controlled the HVAC systems. What changes in efficiency did we find over time for the uncharged fiberglass and charged synthetic filters? For the fiberglass filters, we saw that efficiency did not change much over the four and a half month test period. In this graph, which shows efficiency as a function of particle diameter, the initial efficiency data are shown by green data points with a curve fit through the data, and the efficiency data for day 134 are shown in yellow. While the fitted curves do not overlap, the only statistically significant differences between the two sets of data were small increases in efficiency with time for the very smallest particles. For the synthetic polyolefin fiber filters, the ones that carried electrostatic charge, however, we measured reductions in efficiency over the test period. In this case, the initial data are in green and the data for day 134 are in blue. Efficiency reductions were quite significant, except for particles that were 1.5 micrometers in size and larger. This graph shows efficiency on the vertical axis versus time on the horizontal axis for both the uncharged fiberglass and charged polyolefin filters or particles that were about one micrometer in diameter. For the polyolefin filter in blue, we measured a decrease that started to occur almost immediately upon installation and reached a minimum efficiency around 12 to 13 weeks into the test. After this minimum, we observed a small increase in efficiency through the rest of the test. The efficiency for the fiberglass filter in yellow was almost constant throughout the four and a half month test. The two kinds of filters had similar pressure drops across them throughout the test. This suggested to us that the polyolefin fiber filters that carry electrostatic charge were not well designed because, as we discussed earlier, electrop filters should have higher efficiency for the same pressure drop or lower pressure drop for the same efficiency relative to purely mechanical filters, and this was not the case for this polyolefin fiber filter. In this case, when the filters were new, we had essentially the same efficiency and the same pressure drop. The electric filters should have exhibited a performance advantage when they were clean, but they did not. So what's going on to cause these changes in efficiency for electric filters? The efficiency of the synthetic fiber electric filters fell substantially with use. At the minimum efficiency around 12 to 13 weeks into the test, the electrop filters allowed six times more one micrometer particles to pass through than the uncharged fiberglass filters. This is a significant difference that could lead to increased exposures to particles. 
The scientific literature indicates that collected particles likely shield the charges on the fibers and render them less effective. It must be pointed out that these results represent what happened during one summer in Minnesota using two particular kinds of filters and two particular HVAC systems collecting atmospheric particles. Are these results generalizable? To answer this question, we did another study with better electron filters. In this figure, we show pressure drop as a function of time over our three-month test period in working HVAC systems. We see that the synthetic electron filter we used this time had much lower pressure drop than the uncharged fiberglass filter, which should be the case for a well-designed electron filter, considering that the two kinds of filters had almost identical efficiency at the start of the test. When we look at the changes in efficiency over the three-month test period, we see on the left that the fiberglass filters showed no change in efficiency, just as in the previous test, while, just as in the previous test, the electret synthetic filter exhibited a large decrease in efficiency. So our test results do appear to be somewhat generalizable. What implications do our findings have for the filtration of engineered nanomaterials? We have not yet tested electret filter efficiency as a function of time as the filters capture engineered nanomaterials. This is critical information that occupational hygienists do not yet have. A reasonable hypothesis might be that if engineered nanomaterials are collected on fibrous filters that carry electrostatic charge, we may observe decreases in efficiency similar to reductions we've seen in the tests with atmospheric aerosols, which include nanoscale particles. The data suggests that electret filters suffer a greater loss in efficiency when they are challenged with smaller particles. Until we have data for engineered nanomaterials, we should be cautious with the use of electret filters as a way to collect engineered nanoparticles over extended periods of time. Additional recommendations when using fibrous filters to control particle exposures include to visually evaluate the seal of mounted filters in all applications because having a good seal is critical to ensuring that particles do not flow around the filters with leaking air. In critical applications, we might test leakage between filters and filter mounts using a direct reading particle instrument, such as an optical particle counter or a condensation particle counter. Also, it might be valuable to establish a change-out schedule that is based not only on elevated pressure drop, which is how the time for replacing filters is usually determined so that airflow does not become restricted, but also based on efficiency if the filters being used carry electrostatic charge, and those responsible for replacing the filters should stick to the change-out schedule. Let's consider penetration of particles through respirator filters. These graphs from a paper by Rengasamy and co-authors show penetration as a function of particle diameter. The efficiencies of these respirator filters are rated by the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH, using particles with diameters of 300 nanometers because that was the typical most penetrating particle size for purely mechanical filters, which were once predominant. However, these graphs show that, due to the presence of electrostatic charges on almost all respirator filters that are currently sold, the minimum efficiency and greatest penetration occur for particles that are about 30 to 60 nanometers in diameter. Therefore, the NIOSH filter ratings may not reflect the true minimum efficiency for all particles. In the case of the N95 filters in the left figure, the N95 rating reflects performance appropriately because the penetration is less than 5% for all particle diameters. For the P100 filters in the right figure, the efficiency rating is suitable because the penetration is less than 0.03%, meaning efficiency is greater than 99.97% for all particles. However, not every filter will maintain its rating at 300 nanometers, for all nanoparticles. You can see from the upper curve in the figure on the left, for example, that the efficiency is between 95 and 96% for the most penetrating particle size. The N95 rating is just barely appropriate. For those working with nanoparticles, a key recommendation is to consider using P100 respirator filters that are likely to have very high efficiency for all particle sizes rather than N95 respirator filters that may not be sufficiently protective at critical particle diameters. What do we know about changes in respirator filter penetration with loading of particles? 
Moyer and Bergman performed a study in which they looked at the loading of respirators with sodium chloride particles that included many nanoscale particles. With steady loading, they observed that penetration decreased, efficiency increased, with particle loading, which is good. However, they also looked at intermittent loading, and they found that when they loaded the respirator filter for short periods, left the filter out unprotected in the open air, and then came back repeatedly and loaded that filter again, the initial penetration each day gradually increased over time, even though the penetration within a single day would decrease with loading. The reason for this increase in daily initial penetration has never been explained adequately. Therefore, another key recommendation for those working with nanoparticles is to consider using respirator filters for only a single work shift before switching to a new clean filter. Here are a few key points related to respiratory protection against nanoparticle exposures. Penetration through respiratory protection filters is typically greatest for nanoparticles. For some respirator filters, penetration for nanoparticles may exceed their NIOSH rating because the filters are rated using 300 nanometer particles rather than nanoparticles. The change interval for respiratory protection filters should be short if the respirator filters are actually collecting nanoparticles. If the respirators are being used for secondary protection and are not collecting a significant amount of nanoparticles, then they can be used repeatedly. However, if the filters are loading with nanoparticles during a shift, then go ahead and change the filters out at the end of the shift. After all, filtering face pieces and the filters used with elastomeric respirators are meant to be disposable. We should also remember that respirator fit is vitally important for those working with nanomaterials, just as it is when working with any other contaminant. The fit to the face must be good or those wearing the respiratory protection will be exposed. To summarize this module, fibrous filters can collect airborne nanoparticles with high efficiency, and they are the best air cleaning technology for nanoparticles. For now, changes in filter performance with time as filters collect and load with engineered nanoparticles are hard to predict. Therefore, filter changeouts should be guided by efficiency considerations as well as by pressure drop considerations. Also, filters must be seated properly in filter housings in order to work effectively for, in the case of respirators, the respirators must fit well to the face in order for respirator filters to be effective. This lesson has been created by the Midwest Emerging Technologies Public Health and Safety Training, or METFAST program, a collaboration of the University of Minnesota School of Public Health, the University of Iowa College of Public Health, and Dakota County Technical College. Funding for the METFAST program is provided by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. The content of this lesson is solely the responsibility of the developers and does not necessarily represent the official views of the National Institutes of Health. Thank you for your attention.